um, next is, uh, is Mark Martinez. Yes, sir. And I think we will have questions in the end of the panel to, to everyone. Sounds good. Yeah? Rather than uh, just break, break the flow. OK. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I had a very lovely Prezi, but it looks like the computer is not going to accept it, so this will be a low-tech presentation. Uh, I'm uh, really glad to be following uh, Rob and Dean's uh, smart characterization of Deleuze and Guattari because uh, my project is very much concerned with the scientific thought that both influenced and highly concerned them as theorists. So uh, this study discusses the deployment of photographs as, a particular, as particular types of diagrams in scientific thought and experiments with computers at mid 20th century. I attempt here to illustrate photography's role in a much larger epistemological confluence of theories and concepts that tried to better understand the human being by taking it out of its privileged position in both physical and biological contexts. Systems theory, information theory, and cybernetics have been influential in today's most cutting edge photo imaging technologies, namely digital imaging in computer science and neuroscanning in neurological science. Thus, when I claim that a photograph is a diagram, I am also suggesting that a photograph is a function, that is, a relation of equivalence between two things. A photograph is also a system, and ultimately, I would like to say that a photograph is a machine. I believe that my study contributes to a current trend of investigating the history of our technicity of thought in the West, or the idea that technologies have an immemorial relationship with human beings and how we conceive of ourselves. The human desire to understand the proper or the best relationship between a human being and a tool is ancient, as is the tendency to record that relationship. One could look as far back as Neolithic age cave paintings depicting successful hunting with bow and arrow to get a sense of the innate register with which humans think about and visualize their, their uses of technology. In this sense, cave paintings can be seen just as much as a technical document or a diagram that explains how to as they are artistic representations of tools and of human beings. Specifically, such diagrams derive from a kind of scientific thought that seeks to explain a process, function, or system, rather than a diagram from cartographic thought, which, equally as old, has always been preoccupied with representation and verisimilitude. It is in this sense also that ergonomics, what is defined as the science of the human working properly in her technological environment, which developed in the modern industrial era is arguably an intensification of a kind of knowledge that has been in the making for thousands of years. This intensification has come about with the increasing significance of the machine as the predominant aid to human activity in life and has produced an even newer field of scientific knowledge, namely human factors research, which has risen alongside the modern digital computer. Human factors and ergonomics research, what I call HFE, has, I have, I argue, pushed both photography as an, an, as an epistemological tool and the definition of the human being to their thresholds of recognizability. It does so by its diagrammatic use of photographic images. I use diagrammatic in the indexical sense first, that photographs were, were incorporated in, in this research along with human and computer bodies and other media such as flowcharts, graphical art, text, video, and film. This was done in order to document human-computer interaction, recording the behaviors of both, and creating an overall system. However, I also use diagrammatic in the sense that G. De Deleuze characterizes Michel Foucault's historiography. It is a method of laying bare a part of the much larger shape or schematic of thought that has taken its shape in the past. The diagram shows the ostensibly enduring figure of man from his outside as merely a composition of what Deleuze says, a classical past that never knew him and a future that will no longer know him. For Foucault, the diagram was first and foremost a figure of power. In this sense, the diagram gave space and materialization to an apparatus, such as the prison or the asylum, that before had worked ethereally on the production of human lives. There is, however, I want to suggest, another sense in which Foucault refers to the diagram as a shape of history and of knowledge. To articulate or illuminate the shape of the mechanisms of knowledge production, particularly the sciences, what had previously been formless and unknown. This was the essence of Foucault's history of the present. Fundamentally, the idea of shape 
or to take shape for Foucault was not a form of social or discursive construction, either by the historian or by people. Instead, the shapes of thought that emerged from history, constituted by discourse, objects, and human beings, existed in reality with reality. Uh, I quote Foucault at length here. Eventualization, and this is what I take as synonymous for, with a diagram, eventualization means making visible a singularity at places where there is a temptation to invoke a historical constant, an immediate anthropological trait, or an obviousness that it imposes itself uniformly on all, to show that things weren't necessarily as all that. Eventualization thus works by constructing around the singular event analyzed it as a process or a polygon, or rather a polyhedron of intelligibility, the number of whose faces is not given in advance and can never proper, properly be taken as finite. Now, for G. Deleuze, the shape of the diagram is much more articulated to technological objects when he describes the diagram as a corrective to human history. The diagram eschews the forward march of teleological and anthropocentric time with its insistence equally on the horizontal or the diachronic, the vertical or the synchronic, and that which exceeds both in the diagram, the diagonal line of flight. Deleuze says, either the abstract machines remain prisoner to stratifications, are enveloped in a certain specific stratum whose program or unity of composition they defined, whether an abstract animal, an abstract chemical body, or energy in itself, and whose movements of relative deterritorialization they regulate, or, on the contrary, the abstract machine cuts across all stratifications, develops alone and in its own right on the plane of consistency whose diagram it constitutes, the same machine at work in astrophysics and in microphysics, in the natural and in the artificial. Now, the photograph as diagram shows itself as a thought from the outside, a moment when human-computer interaction breaks from this humanist schematic to produce its own, a non-human diagram of thought whose lines mark collisions between analog and digital mediums and organic and inorganic bodies. The lines as well show the dissolution of human agencies and of media technologies as mere tools. In the very deployment of photography to identify a meaningful human factor in human computer systems, the medium makes visible the absolute limit of a humanist epi epistemology which historically must evaluate all visible phenomena through its own priority. Now, I would like to consider briefly the pioneer plaque as a touchstone uh, and an image, well, it was gonna be an image anyway, uh, in my, my study. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the pioneer plaque was uh, designed and created by astronomer Carl Sagan. It was an attempt to pictorially send out into space uh, what, what he at least intended as a mode of communication to an alien intelligence uh, that needed no hermeneutic background or understanding, N absolutely no information on human beings. Sure. That would be great. Thank you. Uh, so I would like to consider uh, this pioneer plaque. Uh, it was designed to be the most likely chance at meaningful communication from human beings to intelligent extraterrestrial life that happened upon, that happened, would happen upon the Pioneer satellite as it left our system. It was both audacious in its reduction of human culture to diagram form and terribly presumptuous in its dependence on scientific thought, logic, and mathematics as universal features of the universe. Ah, nice. Uh, First and foremost, the plaque deploys the image as diagram and the diagrammatic as the most basic form of communication possible, that which needs no hermeneutic reference. The key for deciphering the entire rest of the, of the imagery of the diagrams on the plaque is a diagram of a hydrogen atom, which you'll see at the top, undergoing change in energy, in an energy state. Uh, second, in its diagram of the process of change in hydrogen, the plaque is meant to express the significance of the binary or digital measure of change from one state to another. Th this is the singular feature of the digital, right? Uh, in the modern sense, in the ancient sense, it's the dialectic, right? Uh, 
Beyond these facts, it is because both this image and the photography within human factors and ergonomics research are concerned fundamentally with communicating the other or otherness. It is both in the sense of communicating to an alien intelligence as the other, one who does not yet know you, and also that image, that that image can communicate otherness as the familiar characteristics of ourselves, of the human rendered alien. This is the denaturing power of the diagram. So quickly, a bit of historical uh, context for human factors and ergonomics. HFE research, as I uh, called it, like the idealistic, audacious, and presumptuous pioneer plaque is fraught with competing notions of what the human is. The disciplinary positions that had emerged at mid-century, the ergonomist, uh, the engineering psychologist, the human engineer, the human factors researcher, these were all variations on a singular imperative to identify and build around a human factor within a given technological system. Coined in 1949 by K.H.F. Merle in England as the science of ergonomics, it was a field that owed its emergence to World War II and the subsequent powerful belief in the West that an intricate relationship between scientific thought and the technology it produced, if left to flourish, could prevent fascism and fundamentally better humankind. HFE research flourished during this high moment of techno-science in the West, or the conflation of science and technology based on this singular belief in its powers uh, to alter realities, either physical, political, or ethical. Merle was attempting to create a multidisciplinary group whose sole purpose was based on the most basic principles of, quote, human research, quote, health, and, quote, the good. What had been the human research group became the ergonomic society and quickly shifted its scope beyond merely conditions of the work environment and beyond as well designing machines of war and of the factory. Ergonomics had to reckon with a new media technology that emerged from, uh, from the Second World War, the digital computer. There was no facet of computer engineering during the 1960s that did not fall under the scope of human factors research. And increasingly, computers began to be constructed to refine the very practice of human factors testing that in turn function to construct better computers. The computer not only for its calculative and memory powers, but especially for its virtual powers or ability to simulate other experiences became the predominant human factors experimental machine. Photography, along with the drawn diagram in turn, became the means of empirically capturing and communicating the given human computer system that was being constructed and experimented on. HFE emerged later as a uniquely American version of British uh, and continental ergonomics. HFE together exist as a field of knowledge strongly linked with the documentarian and empirical uses of photography for human machine systems. Fundamentally, the photographs deployed were complementary to the to new theoretical paradigms that had been formative of the digital computer and of HFE, namely general systems information cybernetics theory theories. With general systems theory or general system theory, Ludwig von Bertalanffy put forth the idea in the 30s that principles and forces in a biological system could be seen to be mirrored in political and social or human systems, as well as in purely physical systems devoid of any life whatsoever. Claude Shannon produced later in information theory a systemic or environmental theory of communication wholly formalizing the language of information and equating both physical systems and models of those physical systems to stochastic processes. He thus articulated a theory of communication that, as Friedrich Hitler says, avoids any reference to ideas or meanings and thus to people. Finally, cybernetics, the theory of organism as machine and its fight against entropy, uh, quote, deals with all forms of machine behavior insofar as they are regular or determinant or reproducible. The materiality is irrelevant. And so is the holding or not of the ordinary laws of physics. The truth of cybernetics are not conditional on their being derived from some other branch of science. Cybernetics has its own foundations. What resulted from the prominence of these theoretical positions, which all de-emphasized identity and differences in order to foreground function and behavior and macro structure, was the deployment of photographic images of all sorts as a series of indices, with no serious reference to anything like a real machine in the experiment. Photographs alongside graphic art, alongside flowcharts, alongside tables and lists and lines of formula, all of these indices were connected by photographic image and all were working to explain the same human machine system, whether it was fully realized, 
wholly theoretical or even impossible to create. I would like to close uh, by returning to the, this idea of communicating otherness. Uh, I would like to just make an admission that an admission that I am fully aware of the militaristic, uh, positivist, and capitalist context out of which human factors and ergonomics emerged, as well as the problematic dehumanizing effects of particular scientific approaches such as behaviorism, which was no doubt influential on these, these scientific uh, knowledges. However, I believe that looking back to this period of scientific thought, which produced system information and cybernetic theories, as well as how photography worked through these systems of thought, can be an ethical choice of understanding technology as a radical other to humans and our understandings of ourselves. First, there has been ample recognition that the most radical of post-structuralist theory utilized in many facets of me media theory owes to a focus on scientific thought. This imperative to understand the historical conditions and the epistemological shape of scientific knowledge as it begins to shape public discourse and policy is an intellectual position I feel has great stakes. Second, I refer here to photography's long anthropological history of both exoticizing as well as demystifying non-Western and colonial subjects. If Bernard Steigler is correct in his claim that technology has immemorial been repressed from human thought, it is that which cannot be let into our identifying ourselves and our valuing of life, then understanding digital computing, our current predominant technology, as the other, will open up a space of understanding so many other others. <laughs> Thank you.